So, so just want to introduce Jerry O'Brien very quickly. He's going to give you more of his background, but I just wanted to say, uh, you know, he's been an incredible supporter of our school. If you go downstairs as you're leaving, there's a beautiful display that has about a hundred of his faces on it on the, in the Chicago Booth magazine. There you go. So everyone should grab them on the way out. I'm, I'm sure they're running out of them. Yeah, they're yeah. just flying off the shelves. Uh, but no, he's been a great supporter of, of our club, of our school, obviously uh, a graduate of GSB, uh, but we won't hold that against him. Yeah. Um, and we're really, really happy to have him here. So if everyone, if you could take your seats after you get your or drink, stand. we appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. So. Uh, can, can I, uh, I, I like to have like a dialogue and a conversation. Real quick, uh, can I get a raise, uh, raise your hand if you're a current student? Okay, fantastic. That's who I was thinking I was talking to. I'm glad, I'm glad to see that that's who we've got. Uh, and, and, you know, you can see by the, the, the headline here, do you get the joke? And I don't know if any of you uh, before grad school, if you worked on a trading floor or not, but this is an expression, does he get the joke? I heard one of the guys in the early session say, is he in on the joke? Right? And what that, what that really means is, do you see the trade? Uh, and I've always thought that this was a really interesting twist of a phrase, because if you think about humor, wit, you know, you can conceive of wit or humor as the ability to recognize something is out of place and have a twist of a phrase to exploit it for a laugh. And in trading, you're trying to instantly see something that's out of place, twist it quickly to capture a profit. And that may be why you know, the, the humor on trading desk is a little bit bawdy, but definitely funny. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm going to try and hope you, that you learn as GSB grads, and I notice there's some Michigan, there's a couple of Northwestern or Kellogg here, uh, hope to, you know, help you to get the joke as we go through this. Um, O'Brien Staley Partners uh, is the firm. I'm obviously Jerry O'Brien. It's a, a firm that we started in 2010 and it has three principal areas of business. It's best known for its value investing business. Hugh Cameron, who is a Booth grad, uh, is managing director in, in the business, uh, and we have uh, 1.1 billion of assets under management invested in what we call unloved commercial industrial credits. Some people call them distressed. We're a little friendlier in Minnesota. We call them unloved. And, and uh, uh, so Hugh's, Hugh's, Hugh's here. You can talk to him during the cocktail reception. Uh, another business unit we have is impact investing, and that's the subject of, of that uh, article in the magazine. Matt Ryline is here. Matt Ryline is the portfolio manager for impact investing. Uh, in his previous career, Matt, before joining our firm, did $5 billion in impact investing for J.P. Morgan Chase. <laughs> the third branch of O'Brien Steely Partners is a niche servicer of uh, economic development and low-income housing deposit loans. Uh, it's a 42-year-old business that we acquired about three or four years ago. <clears throat> they service for 300 cities, counties, states, and 115 Habitat for Humanity agencies. So notionally, they have $8 billion of mortgage servicing rights uh, in that business unit. Um, so I'm going to uh, walk you through here. The first thing, is this up? Is it working? There. Uh, the compliance officers require this, so my apologies for this slide. Uh, but you're not required to read it. Just like when you go to the car rental agency, mentally put your eyes on an initial here and here. You're not invited to invest, uh, and this is for discussion purposes only. So, uh, and then, of course, you know, you, you said that is the bio. Anybody like James Gaffigan, the, the comedian? You know, you got that little James Gaffigan voice. Who's he? You know, <laughs> and why is he on that magazine? Wait a minute, this picture. That's false marketing. That guy is not, you know, is that his younger brother? What is that picture all about? Uh, so obviously there's the 41-year-old Jerry and there's the 50-year-old Jerry. Uh, and and uh, to answer your questions, uh, you know, if you've never heard of us, that proves our marketing strategy is working. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my, real quick, to give you my bona fides, uh, I, I was born in the cradle of distress, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, I went undergraduate to the University of Michigan any Wolverines in the room? A couple Wolverines? I think we can all agree it's a turnaround opportunity. Okay. <laughs> uh, my first job out of, out of college was a, a chemical bank in New York. Uh, I was recruited into the debtor and possession financing uh, department. Darla Moore was the queen of dip in the uh, late 80s, uh, and, and that's really where I cut my teeth. It was your prototypical two, three-year BA analyst program before going to grad school. Came here to what I call GSB, you call Booth, but David Booth didn't pay any of my tuition, so I still call it uh, the GSB. Uh, 
uh, and I studied analytic finance, graduated in 1994. Between my first and second year uh, here at Chicago, I was recruited by Cargill Value Investment. Uh, I was there as a summer associate. I wound up spending 17 years in distress investing for Cargill and Carval, and it's, I don't want to spend a whole time. Summer associate, full-time associate, VP, MD, business unit leader, one of the founding partners of Carval Investors, and at the very end of my career there, I was global head of loan portfolio investing, uh, managing 52 people on four continents. Uh, in 2010, uh, I left to form O'Brien Staley Partners uh, with Warren Staley. Warren is the retired chairman and CEO of Cargill Incorporated. He was there for 39 years. He was the president, chairman, CEO for his last 12 years. But Cargill has a mandatory retirement age of 65. And so when Warren retired, he planted a seed with, as I've shaken his hand, thanking him for setting the tone. He said, Jerry, if you ever want to do anything entrepreneurial, you'll let me know, won't you? And fast forward the clock, uh, we, we formed O'Brien Staley Partners to build a business specializing on credit, all sorts of credit, distress credit and impact credit and mortgage servicing rights, et cetera. Um, lastly, uh, my, my community service uh, in, in, in the Twin Cities, I'm, I have been on the board and on the investment committee for both the Minnesota and the St. Paul Community Foundations. Uh, in aggregate across all their little buckets of money, about $1.3 billion endowment in a fully diversified, you know, 10-year modern portfolio finance uh, uh, basis. All right. So my, my goal today is I'm hoping to teach you one thing, and that's to conceive of credit in three dimensions and to learn one term. The term is attachment. And, you know, if you look at a capital stack, you get to choose... You get to choose where you want to invest on this capital stack. Uh, and there was a person early today, uh, uh, she was the reporter woman talking about the, 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 the uh, Toys R Us. Uh, and, you know, presto, 3.1 billion of new dip financing. And in the, in the UK, I think it's, they said a 10% coupon. And, and in the US, it was uh, LIBOR plus 400, top of the capital stack, pretty secure, might be a good place to attach. Uh, but in any event, you know, thinking up and down the capital stack, the priority of claims, and then thinking through and reasoning your risk and return, your up-down, if you will. Now, you, not only do you look at a, a, the balance sheet, you know, up and down, but left and right. So it is possible to choose to invest on either the right-hand side of the balance sheet, the capital stack, or the left-hand side. Are there assets in this firm or this situation that I want to buy? And the guy from Hilco, he's in the business of buying credits I'm not buying credits, of buying assets that are being liquidated by the realtors. He goes, he goes to a distressed situation, but he plays the left side. And so you don't have to always play the bonds. Sometimes you can buy the assets from a distressed uh, estate as well. And then the third thing to think about, uh, you know, call it in and out. So you got up and down, left and right, in and out of the hold co or the operating company versus the parent company. And so you can, you know, you, when you see a situation, uh, you, you get to choose as an investor, do I want to be in the operating company, the hold company, or do I want to get closer to the operations, the cash flow, the assets? And so you choose where you want to, you know, attach, your attachment point. And I thought maybe we'd go through three examples of trades to give you the concept here. Uh, we have been very active uh, in Puerto Rico. And, and there is an expression in, in our shop, uh, if you know how to make money, why would you ever tell anybody? Okay? So we're not actually going to write you the whole thing. But uh, uh, the, the, our play in Puerto Rico, and as this panel was explaining very detailed, uh, $72 billion of distress in Puerto Rico. Well, that's the right side of the balance sheet. What's going on on the left side of the balance sheet? That right side of the balance sheet seems to be undefined and hard to work through. And, boy, I'm not really certain what my recovery is going to be. And is it $50 billion of unfunded pensions or is it $55 billion of unfunded pensions? Uh, well, we go to the other side. We play the left side of the balance sheet in Puerto Rico. Hugh? Uh, is, is the leader on this strategy for us. Can you just kind of, don't give away the trading secrets because it's still working, but give them a sense of scope and scale and what we're doing. Yeah, so we have done five discrete trades with the uh, state-owned development bank of Puerto Rico, um, totaling 70 million investment amount. Um, these trades were to purchase performing unloved commercial loans in Puerto Rico, um, and those five trades total 140 million of principal amount. So on average, we paid about 50 cents on the dollar. Yeah. 
So earlier today, uh, there was the guy with the great beard. Uh, um, what was that guy's name? David. David Mueller. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I asked the question about, uh, no, it wasn't. Well, somebody was talking about the sovereign ceiling. And, and we, we, we believe that, uh, you know, there can be corporate credits that have a better risk return than the sovereign credit. Uh, and so we've identified a lot of that. And the other thing, if you think about, we're talking about Puerto Rico right now, but you know, as the previous panel mentioned, you know, almost every state and most cities uh, has a chronic operating budget deficit, uh, not even talking about their unfunded pensions. And when you have that many players, you know, usually you call it a distressed industry. And when you have a distressed industry, industries heal the same way. There's three, way, there's three steps they do. The first thing they do is they divest unnecessary assets. And that's what we engage in. We buy economic development, the loans they've made to businesses. Uh, the other thing they do is they rationalize costs. And, and uh, you know, the third thing they do is look for new sources of revenue. Well, we're playing in the very first of that and buying the assets on the left-hand side. There was a group speaking earlier. Uh, uh, it was, it, again, it was the, the emerging markets guys. And they were talking about credit cycles and disruption of credit markets. And uh, uh, in the U.S. market even, you don't even have to be in the emerging markets, Credit markets do get, get disrupted. And we noticed uh, in 2016, everybody noticed in 2016, three macroeconomic disruptions of the credit markets. The first one was uh, in January, and it ran kind of almost to the first week of March of 2016, and that's when the oil prices plummeted. The consequence of the oil prices plummeting was anybody invested in that in a levered fund uh, with redemption calls had to sell things. And when you have to sell things to face redemptions, you sell what you can, not what you want. Uh, the third disruption was in June. It was Brexit. Uh, you know, caught the markets off guard, and then people start, started having redemption calls. The third disruption, and that lasted about two weeks. So the first one lasted about two months. Third one lasted about two weeks. The third disruption in 2016 was uh, the surprise of President Trump being elected. And that disruption lasted about two days. Uh, you know, so two months, two weeks, two days. In my opinion, you could reverse the order, and it would have been two months, two weeks, two days, because what happened in, in, in the credit markets, people got squeezed and they puked out their assets to get liquidity. And then they got squeezed again and they got squeezed again. Well, you squeeze a grape three times, you don't get any more juice out of it, right? And, and so it didn't really matter which event happened first. It was the, the path traveled that drove that. So how do we play that? Well, we don't run into energy or, or into sovereign credits, but when people get squeezed, as I said, uh, they sell what they can, not what they want. And so we were tracking this headline risk for Banco Popular. Everybody didn't like it because of the stress in, in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, obviously. And this uh, institution is perceived as being, you know, sovereign ceiling capped out. But if you actually look at this company, uh, it's more than just the parent company with this public equity. What you can do is say, hey, you know what, I don't like that. But look at this subsidiary, which is strictly mainland U.S., and we discovered that there was operating debt uh, at the operating level that only $145 million tranche, but we were able to buy that at 82 cents on the dollar to get a 12% yield to maturity because the guy had to sell. He was getting pressure on his Puerto Rican holdings, the headline risk in his shop, and so we picked that up. So this gives you an example of in and out of the operating structure, so, you know, the way we tackle those things. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, that, I mean, so, so you have to study this and have a view on it. And so we actually have a price view uh, on every tranche of Banco Popular. So if we're following a credit, we're following every tranche of that credit in the parent company and the subsidiaries. You know, if something you can see, there's a couple here we list as does not trade. So we just know it's not in the active market. So you're not underwriting or pricing that, but all the other ones that are trading. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. 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 Yeah. So uh, uh, we have about 17 people, but about 10 of them are investment professionals, and seven are operational support. Um, and and there, there's a study recently about uh, in, until recently computers 
were unable to beat uh, uh, chess professionals. Uh, and, and I think I actually heard Schrager say this. I, I, in fact, I know Schrager was saying this. I, anybody here have Schrager? Jim Schrager? So, yeah, okay. So uh, the, the point being that until we got the new computing power, uh, it was the computers were trying to do too many calculations, and the discovery is that experts ask fewer due diligence questions, not more. You put your finger on the issue to, to analyze and, and you know, disregard the rest. Um, and so you know, I guess there's some 20 years of experience and intuition that I think we should start studying that Banco Popular. I bet someone's going to have to puke it out. And look over here, it's, you're not actually bearing Puerto Rican exp uh, exposure. So, you know, you just kind of, you're, you're looking at it and say, now study that, at what price do we care? That's a, everybody heard that phrase on trading desks? You know, do you care? That's a question of your price at which you are a buyer or a seller on the other side, but, yep. Okay? I like this. Thank you for the questions. Um, all right, so um, I'm, now, uh, I'm now going to roll to up and down the capital stack, and we're going to, going to show you an impact investment which follows the exact same precedent. And I know... I know you got that little Jim Gaffigan voice going, oh my God, impact here at Chicago? You know, surely you're not going to torture us that way. Uh, yeah, you see, it is going on. Um, but you, we're going to walk you through impact investing from a Chicago perspective and its rock solid credit strategy. Uh, and and I, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, in addition to leading O'Brien Staley Partners, I also serve on the board uh, of uh, the Minnesota community. The, the Minnesota and St. Paul Community Foundations. And going back like six years ago, uh, this notion of impact investing came up with great passion in the boardroom. It came up four years, five years ago, four years ago, kept coming up perennially. Uh, and in our investment committee, which is full of analytic MBAs and CPAs and CFAs, uh, it was not being, you know, truly understood or analyzed. Uh, uh, because we've all done the optimization math, right? And we all know to the core of our being that you cannot achieve uh, superior optimized returns in large numbers over a large period of time by adding more constraints to your constraint optimization function. But if you ask yourself a different question, if you ask yourself where do superior returns come from, I believe the answer to that is superior returns come from expertise and focus where someone else has a constraint. And so, Matt, I'd like you to actually walk people through uh, the, this trade so they understand the full dynamics of what we invested in and why. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so I've been a lot of people have been out to San Francisco, maybe and spent some time there working or living. Uh, this is a project in the south of Market neighborhood, which is adjacent to downtown. It's a transitioning neighborhood. And this is a uh, 10.25 or $10.3 million senior debt investment to support the acquisition and rehabilitation of an abandoned church. Uh, so since most of you are current students, you, may not remember this, but in the late 80s, there was a very large earthquake in, in, in California, and this church has been sitting vacant ever since then. Um, so this church has been contributing to the blight and the underinvestment in this neighborhood. So from an impact perspective, there's a triple benefit here. One is they're going to uh, reactivate this building uh, and turn it into creative office space, because what else would you build in San Francisco these days but creative office space? And that's going to bring in relatively, it's going to reduce blight, and it's going to uh, bring in uh, 150 relatively high paying jobs into this low income community. So think about the foot traffic and the catalytic impact of that. And then, third, the developers have teamed up with uh, nonprofits to uh, run a workforce development program out of the cafe in the building. They're going to train formerly homeless people in food service and put them on a career trajectory. So there's the impact story. From an underwriting perspective, uh, you see here we're at 54% LTV. So we put in $10.3 $10 million against about a $19 million appraised value. So very strong asset value. Uh, second, the guarantors here uh, are worth about $50 million, and they're fully joint severally guaranteeing the loan. So we've got about 5x coverage on our loan guarantee. And then third, we have a lease in place. So as soon as this building is done, which it's in the final stages of right now, uh, the lease will put us in positive debt, debt service coverage uh, from day one, so a great underwriting story. Okay. So now to the attachment, you look at the capital stack. So you see us at the top of this capital stack. It's a $10.3 million senior debt investment. And it's senior to $8.2 million of tax credit equity. And so the banks, in this instance it was U.S. Bank, purchased the tax credits that are generated 
by putting in, uh, capital into low-income communities. And so the bank is actually subordinate to us. Um, now, we can make an investment here at a 7-7 gross IRR in a senior position because of the regulatory constraints that banks face for making this type of loan. There's an, uh, Jerry's going to show you a complicated structure chart that will show that, that we can put in a, uh, our senior debt and still get a 7-7 return uh, on a 54% asset value. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention one more thing about our, our metrics. So I am the impact guy, right? So uh, in addition to the financial returns that we have here, we also have a, an impact return. And we've de devised a, an impact metric, very similar to a financial metric, uh, that's 182 jobs that we want to see created per $10 million worth of fund investment. And so you'll see that this, with this uh, project, we're at 154% of that industry benchmark. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And, and uh, you did foreshadow. I didn't want people to think it was simple. It's actually quite complex. We're trying to simplify the story. So there's actually four corporate entities. You have to follow the investment through four corporate entities, but we are at the very top of the capital stack. And it's because of this complexity that we're able to capture alpha. And I'm certain those of you who read the screen and saw 422 bips of alpha, you said, bullshit, show it to me. So, uh, so okay. So here, here yeah, right? Uh, yeah, I went to Chicago. I'm with you. Uh, so here's, here's an actual yield bridge uh, breaking out. Now, you can start at a different place, you know, if you want to have a different benchmark. We benchmarked it to the five-year treasury, and we recognize it's, it's a fixed-rate uh, 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 private credit, so then we took it up to uh, uh, the prime, corporate prime rate uh, at the time. Uh, I don't know if you got it, but the, it is necessary to write this as a seven-year interest only, uh, and that's so that the guy below us uh, is, is a certain of his financing through the tax compliance period. So we think that's about 100 bips. You can argue whether we are capturing 100 or we should be moving our benchmark up. So maybe you would say, okay, Jerry, it's really 322 or something like that. We can have that debate. Uh, and then uh, uh, it's an indirect collateral position, as we showed you the, 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 uh, the three or four different sources and uses. Uh, the intercreditor agreement is hellacious, uh, and that's really where we get a lot. Uh, Matt, having done five billion of this over uh, uh, 12 years at J.P. Morgan Chase, is a master of it, and the other parties understand and recognize him as a very good counterparty to be on the top of the capital stack. Because, as you know, in intercreditor agreements, the top of the capital stack is the guy with the most power and clout, uh, and the banks don't want another bank on top of them. Really, they like us, Matt, in particular, to be on top of them and acting reasonably from the senior secured position. Uh, we, we, we do uh, our, our interest rate conversion for O'Brien Staley Partners is actual over 360, continuous compounding. Most banks do actual over, uh, actual, over actual monthly compounding. So that little twist of convention uh, accounts for, what is that, 36, 38 bips. Uh, and then there's some discount points involved too. And so that's the total yield bridge. Uh, that, you know, that's, you know, we think it's important to understand where and how are you making money for your investors. And I think that's a pretty big differentiator between uh, a lot of other players in the uh, impact investing space. Okay. If we, if we have time, I thought I would just play, you know, alumna, alumnus coach and, and mentor and say, you know, not where should you invest, but where should you invest your career? Right? I, I would imagine you're all here wondering if you should get into this area, that area, or, or whatever. And, and uh, I, I thought the panels were great. I thought the insight was great. And I thought maybe, you know, distill it down a little bit. We all go to school at a place where, where you know, the, the, the conventional wisdom, the school of thought for the University of Chicago is if markets are efficient, dot, 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 nothing matters. You can't do anything. Throw darts, whatever. Um, but, but it's, you know, the key to that is if. That's the key to the Chicago School of Thought. It's if markets are efficient, then it doesn't matter. Well, guess what? Go find an inefficient market, right? And inefficient in terms of two things, capital and career or, you know, your talent prospects. Uh, and so, you know, I, I listed four things here that I look out forward. If I were coming out now, I would think about these four areas uh, to, to invest my career. Municipal finance, you know. I, do they have a course in municipal finance at the University of Chicago? I don't think so. I can't remember ever having a conversation in the pub at Ida Noise about, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go into municipal finance. 
never came up, right? Which, I mean, this, this guy was, was brilliant, and he is a Chicago grad. I think he's the exception. He proves the rule. I don't think you're going to face a lot of Chicago booth competition in municipal finance. And if you want to become an expert in distressed municipal finance, man, that's, that's a fraternity with like six members in it. Uh, so it's a definite opportunity to, uh, to, to capture the market. Um, trade finance or factoring. You know, I listened to all these conversations about retail, 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 and, and, and I heard them, and they kind of danced around it, but it just didn't seem to bubble up. To me, retail, the value driver of retail for our parents' era was location, location, location. Get a corner location, get the foot traffic and sell. And now, of course, everybody understands Amazon, okay? We got that. That's not new. What I think people are missing is Amazon is not only winning on the location not mattering, trade finance. Trade finance, the zero cost of funds for $3 billion, now, you know, they're paying 10% for that dip line at, at uh, Toys R Us. Well, that's what happened to the damn profits. They're paying for the trade finance. So once you lose your trade finance relationship, you're out of the retail business, no matter what your business is. If you've got to fill the store with inventory. So the guys who are winning right now, or maybe surviving is the definition of winning, uh, Best Buy. So Best Buy is still doing it. And what they've done is they have repostured themselves as the showroom for Dell and Microsoft and all the other, you know, and so they're doing showroom. And by being the showroom and not overly worrying about whether people buy it on their phone while they're in the store, they're getting advantageous trade terms from their suppliers. And if you get free inventory, you got a cost, you know, you cost advantage there. So anyway, think about trade, finance, or factoring uh, as the new value driver for retail and maybe a potential career uh, for you guys. Uh, MSRs, mortgage servicing rights. I know there's a great uh, fixed income program. I studied it in the analytic finance, uh, but it's usually POs and IOs and all that kind of stuff. Well, MSRs, mortgage servicing rights, uh, is, is a form of structured credit. You can play it either in the synthetic and in the, in the, in the uh, structured credit or in the operating plays. Uh, and, and early on, uh, who was the first speaker, the professor I never had? So, yeah. Uh, I, my takeaway from him was we're all pretty sure rates are going up, right? Okay, well, if rates are going up, what does that mean to banks? Well, deposit rates are usually sticky, so if rates go up, deposit rates are sticky, net interest margin is going to, going to widen. It's probably going to be good, and you can actually see it right now in community bank multiples. Uh, they're now change of control are, are trading around 1.7 to 2.2 2, 2, 2 times book value. Uh, the publicly traded market's not trading with that kind of a premium. But the other thing out there, mortgage servicing, when rates go up, prepayment speeds go down, mortgage servicing rates lengthen in time and become more valuable. So there's, there's, you know, if, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do for the next five years, go long mortgage servicing rights, either operationally or, or synthetically. Uh, the last thing is impact investing. We don't have a lot of talented competition. Uh, we're, we're pretty much all alone in that space. And uh, we've got our new summer associate right here. Give a little wave, Sarah. Sarah's our summer associate, uh, and we're, we're going to make a market there. And, uh, you know, you, you actually, don't worry. You guys don't need to do that. We'll, we'll do it without you. So that's uh, good. <laughs> Uh, but most importantly, my, my advice, you know, enjoy your work. You know, have some joy. So, you know, do what you want, where, you know, where you want, with whom you want. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a University of Chicago alum, and I'm happy to, to field any, any questions if uh, you guys have any. Yeah. How did you, so I know you mentioned earlier that you tried to create, it was it 180 jobs per 10 million of investment. How yep. did you come up with these benchmarks? Do you have different ones, like if it's, say, like an environmental? We do, yeah. So uh, we actually have an audit, you know, so if you're an L, are you an LP or were you an LP? That's a great LP question. Yeah. Okay. I've been on the other side of the due diligence table before, so I've gotten. You've gotten, okay, yeah. So uh, we do have an audit trail. So 182 is the industry benchmark. The program is almost 20 years old. It, it was born with uh, Bob Rubin in the, uh, uh, and, and so these tax credits, the people enjoying the tax credits are required to give job creation filings to the U.S. Treasury. So we are not required to do it, but in a part of our intercreditor agreement, we say all those reports you're giving to Treasury, you're giving to us also. And so, you know, there's always a, a question of, of uh, uh, measurement integrity, especially in impact investing. Uh, so we take a little bit of comfort that, well, if you're lying, you're lying to Treasury. 
uh, and you know people are disinclined to lie to the U.S. Treasury, uh, and so that's that's where we get it. So 182 is is the 16 year, I don't know, 18 year industry average of jobs created uh, by virtue of investments with the New Markets Tax Credit. Yep, and then we do have others. We 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 do uh, green energy. We do retrofitting, uh, and in the retrofitting, uh, there's a, uh, an industry. What is a pace nation? So. 458,000 square feet of commercial space should be retrofitted per $10 million investment. Now, there's different kinds of commercial buildings. A hotel where every room has a different unit is more expensive than a warehouse, so we have to do a portfolio construction to get that in aggregate. Uh, not every deal is going to exceed, but in aggregate, we're, we're doing much better. Yeah? I'd be interested in hearing why you believe uh, municipal distress is a growth uh, well, I, I totally disagreed with what he was saying, blaming it on the auto industry, because I grew up in Detroit. Uh, and, and my father worked his whole – actually, every member of my family worked for the auto industry. Have you ever been to Detroit? Have you ever driven over eight mile and you go from Detroit into the suburbs? Okay? And that's why Eminem has the eight mile movie and all that. Um, that's not a mountain range. That's not a river. There is no difference other than a political boundary. And, and I believe that it is 100 percent the decay of Detroit is the responsibility of the governance of Detroit because there's no problem in Dearborn. There's no problem in Birmingham, Bloomfield, Farmington, you know, wherever you want to go. So it's, it's, it's not the auto industry is a narrative that is not holding water with me. Um, so why do I think it's a growth industry? Uh, because every... State and almost every city has a chronic operating budget deficit, and we're not even talking about the pensions. They spend more than, than they want. Do you want to know why? You want to go to back to the, the question these guys were struggling with, root cause? I mean, that was a little bit of what I think you were asking earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, root, I, I think they hit it. The root, root cause is it's easier to promise you uh, COLA, cost of living adjustments, than to argue against it. I think it's weak management and weak negotiators without a consequence. Yeah, oh, way over here. Yeah, I, actually, I'll just make a comment because I'm a recovering real estate developer. Yeah. I will tell you, if you haven't been to Detroit um, lately, yeah. Detroit is undergoing an amazing renaissance. Yeah. And there's, a, there's, a, there's one individual, or a couple individuals in particular that are responsible. And so Dan Gilbert, the guy yep. who's Quicken Mortgage uh, and several uh, companies and the Cleveland Cavaliers, um, basically said 15 years ago, like, Detroit has turned into hell. I'm going to take my 30,000 employees, move downtown. Yep. He bought literally half of downtown for almost nothing. Yeah, well, he, uh, yeah, he's got billions into it, and he's, he's, he's killing it. The portion of Detroit you're referring to is the CBD, the Central Business District. It's 7.2 square miles out of 140 right. square miles of the city. So, uh, but, you know, we're... we're I'm from Detroit, nothing but upside. Yeah. Um, I heard you mention you know, um, investing on the uh, asset side of the balance sheet. You mentioned specifically the uh, commercial loans you bought on Puerto Rico. Yep. Cents the dollar. So, you know, you know why, were you, why were you able to find that opportunity? And, you know, yeah. What seems like a really large margin to take to go into it, and also if you're buying it, what's going to stop that hedge? Um, other people can fight that hedge and kind of put the reach in that alpha, so to speak. So uh, uh, going back 20 years now, 1996, I've personally been engaged uh, in economic development, the secondary market for economic development loans, and that's actually how Matt and I first, first met. So I've personally sourced, negotiated, purchased, resolved economic development loan portfolios from the state of South Carolina, the state of Virginia, the state of New Jersey, the state of New York, the city of New York, the District of Columbia, the city of Baltimore, the city of Cincinnati, State of Washington, City of Columbus, a couple loans in Philadelphia, some in Minnesota. Uh, and so as I rattle these off, uh, you know, every industry is a cottage industry. Every, every community is tight-knit. Uh, economic development practitioners know each other. Uh, and uh, when they're evaluating whether to do a transaction or not, uh, they think through a few worries, if you will. Uh, they worry... Uh, about inviting you to participate, and they want to know if you have any experience with these assets. What they really mean, not with these assets, 
Who do you know that I know that can call up and ask, what's it like to work with O'Brien Staley Partners before, during, and after a transaction? Is it a mistake to invite these guys, or will I be okay inviting them in? We score very highly in what's called an RFQ, Request for Qualifications. Uh, the second thing is they, they'll say, um, what is your strategy for servicing these assets? And if you're coming off of a trading desk, uh, first of all, you can't stand answering the questionnaire, right? And so uh, the questionnaire itself is a buried entry. Uh, but the, the, the standard answer would be to pull out the manual, open it up and say on the 15th day we give them a courtesy call, on the 30th day we send them a letter, and on the 45th day we hire a law firm or whatever you know, the case might be. Well, that's not what they were really wondering. They were wondering, how do I know I can trust you to be reasonable with a situation that I can't even conceive of yet, but it's going to come up as soon as I give you my assets? Uh, and we score high on that because we own Amerinat, the 42-year-old business that does the servicing of economic development loan portfolios for 300 cities, counties, states, and Habitat for Humanity agencies. Uh, so that was the other arm of our, of our business. Uh, and so there's the trust component that, yeah, we've been servicing for 42 years and we don't, they're not kneecap breakers, right? You just work it out. You know, when, when, when a credit stops paying, uh, our philosophy is you ask yourself, ourselves, we ask ourselves this question, is this a credit crisis or a credit criminal? And don't confuse the two. A credit crisis means the cash flow has been disrupted, something has happened, let's deal with the facts, give us the information, and we'll work through it. A credit criminal doesn't give you financials, doesn't answer your call, transfers assets into his or her spouse's name, you know, and is being a wise guy. With a credit criminal, all you can do is go to court, right? With a credit crisis, let's deal with the facts. And, you know, if it's going to take an extra three years, it's going to take an extra three years. If you need the Christmas season off, you know, cash flow off, uh, you know, take, take it off. Uh, and and that's, that's the way you earn a reputation for being a smart investor and a good servicer, and, you know, the whole thing comes together. One more question. No, kill it. We're going to kill it. Oh, uh, tell you what, they're going to have a uh, cocktail party or no? I'll hang around for the cocktail party. Matt's here. Uh, and Hugh's here too. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. Yeah. I, hope, I hope you guys get the joke. Hope you guys get the joke, and I hope you think three dimensionally about you know, up and down, left and right, in and out, attachment point. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.